I took three months hiatus from YouTube, but now I'm back. Getting back into the video making routine was extremely hard, making this video one of the toughest videos I have ever made. So give it a watch, and if you find it interesting, consider supporting my channel by liking this video, sharing it with others, or even considering supporting me through Patreon, PayPal, or buying me a virtual coffee on coffee. And now, without any further ado, let's jump into the video. A while back I made a video reviewing those cool LoRa radio modules I received from Rayax. They communicate over a serial interface and offer an impressive range of up to 10 km. <laughs> By the way, I still need to make a follow-up video to test that range in real conditions. However, sometimes you don't need this kind of range. And let's not forget the steep price tag, about $15 for a pair. So today I am taking a look at much cheaper option the NRF24L01 radio modules. These are very different. They communicate over an SPI interface and typically provide a range of about 10 to 30 meters indoors and up to 100 meters outdoors. Best of all, they cost just a fraction of the price of LoRa modules. You can grab a pair for around $1. Let's look at the module pinout. As you can see, we have two rows of four male header pins. They are not labeled, which is not ideal. Let's go through them one by one. Ground, VCC, chip enable pin, chip select pin, clock, MOSI for transmitting data, MISO for receiving data, and IRQ, interrupt pin. The interrupt pin is a cool feature that allows the receiver to react only when there is incoming transmission, without constantly checking for data in the main code. I won't cover this feature in this tutorial, maybe that will be a good topic for part 2. Keep in mind that the SPI related pins cannot be connected to just any pin. On Arduino boards you need to use pins D11 to D13, while on ESP boards this would typically be pins D5 to D7. Let's go ahead and connect all the required components. Here is our radio module along with its reference pinout. Since the module operates at 3.3 volts logic, I chose the Wemos D1, which also uses 3.3 volts logic. This way I don't need to use level shifters. The NRF24 is known to be highly sensitive to the quality of its 3.3 volts power supply. Even brief voltage dips can cause communication failures or module resets. To ensure stable operation, my project powers the module with an external regulated 3.3 volts supply. Connecting the ground to the negative side and VCC to the positive side of the supply. Make sure the jumpers on the power supply module are set to 3.3 volts. I will also add a 100 microfarad decoupling capacitor between the positive and negative connections of the module. Then we continue by connecting chip enabled pin to digital pin D2, the chip select pin to digital pin D1, the clock line goes to pin D5, MOSI master out slave in for transmitting data goes to D7, and MISO master in slave out for receiving data goes to D6. Finally, it is important to connect the grounds of the microcontroller and the external power supply together. We need to create two identical setups like this, one for the transmitter and one for the receiver. And here they are. Since I have only one power module for the breadboard, I used it for the transmitter as it is more sensitive to the power dips on the power supply. I am hoping I can get away with powering the radio module directly from microcontroller. We will soon find out if it works. Before we start writing the code, we need to install the rf24.h library, which allows us to interface with the nrf24 module. To do this, follow the usual process for installing any Arduino library. Find the library on GitHub and download the zip file. Open the Arduino IDE, go to Sketch, include library, add the zip library and select the downloaded zip file. The library will be installed and ready to use. While we are in Arduino IDE, let's also select the microcontroller board we'll use for this project, the Wemos D1. 
ESP boards are not included by default, so you need to install their board's definition separately. There are plenty of step-by-step -step instructions available online if you need guidance on adding ESP8266 and ESP32 boards to the Arduino IDE. Let's look at various methods offered by the RF24 library. I have grouped them into three categories. The first category is initialization and configuration. RF24 method creates the RF24 object and links it to the chip enable and chip select pins connected to the module. Begin initializes the radio module. It's usually called in the setup function and returns true if the module is detected. Set PA level adjusts the power amplifier level. Lower levels save power, while higher levels provide more range and stability. Set data range sets the data rate for transmission. Lower rates give you more range, while higher rates let you transfer data faster. Set channel changes the radio frequency channel, which helps avoid interference or run multiple networks in the same area. The second category is pipe setup. Each radio module supports up to six data pipes for receiving data and one active pipe for writing. These pipes use unique addresses so that one radio can talk to multiple devices. Open writing pipe defines the address where outgoing data will be sent so the module knows where to direct its messages or listen to multiple sources. Open reading pipe opens one of the six listening pipes, each with a unique address, so the module can receive data from multiple sources. And the third category is data transmission and reception. Stop listening switches the module into transmit mode, getting it ready to send data. Start listening switches the module into receive mode, so it can listen for incoming pockets. Available checks if there is data waiting in the receive buffer and optionally tells you which pipe received it. Write sends data to the configured address. It returns true if the message is successfully acknowledged by the receiver. Read retrieves the data from the receive buffer so you can process it in your program. The transmitter code includes the SPI and RF24 libraries to communicate with the radio module. We create RF24 object called radio with chip enable on pin D2 and chip select on pin D1 and define a 6 byte address for the communication pipe. In the setup we start the serial monitor and initialize the radio module. If the module fails an error is printed and the program stops. If the module is properly initialized we then open a writing pipe to the address, set a low power level for stability and put the radio in transmit mode. In the loop, a constant string hello is sent using write and the result is printed to the serial monitor as either send hello or send failed. The loop waits 3 seconds before repeating, continuously transmitting the message to the receiver listening on the same address. This is a receiver sketch for the radio module. The setup lines are the same as in the transmitter sketch. We include the libraries, create the RF24 object with chip enable on D2 and chip select on D1, use the same address, initialize the radio module and set power level. The difference is that we open a reading pipe and start listening. In the loop, the receiver checks if the data is available, reads up to 32 bytes into a buffer and prints the message to the serial monitor, continuously displaying any messages sent by the transmitter. So let's see if the transmitter and the receiver can communicate with each other. To observe output messages on both, I will add an OLED display to the transmitter and redirect the messages that were previously sent to the serial monitor to the OLED display. And then power the module from the external 3 volts power supply and connect it to pins D1 and D2 which are the I2C pins on the WeMOS D1 board. SCL goes to D1, SDA goes to D2. This means we can no longer use those two pins for the chip enable and chip select connections of the radio module. No worries, we can simply use pins D3 and D4 instead. Since we don't need to connect the transmitter to the PC, 
we can power it from the 5 volts power supply. To do this change the jumper on the breadboard power module to 5 volts for the bottom rail, then connect the positive side of the power supply to the 5 volts pin of the microcontroller. The link to the adjusted transmitter code can be found in the description of this video. The receiver will be connected to the PC, so I can still show the results in a serial monitor. And that's it, we are ready to go. The receiver is already connected to the PC and is listening for incoming data. Let's connect the external power supply to the breadboard power module. When I switch it on, you can immediately see that the text is sent and received on the receiver side. The transmission repeats every 3 seconds. If you disconnect the receiver, you will see failures reported on the transmitter side, confirming that the connection is live and working. Now let's test the range. To do this I had to equip the receiver with the OLED display since I wouldn't be able to use serial monitor during the test. The idea is that the transmitter will send a string every 10 seconds, TX plus the transmission index like TX1, TX2, TX3 and so on. The receiver will display the received data sets. The numbers will help us to determine if any packets are lost during the test. So here we are outside. You can see both the transmitter and the receiver. Let's start the transmission. You can see the first packet has been received. I am now walking away from the transmitter, counting my steps. One step is roughly one meter. The second packet has been received. You can see me walking away on the right side of the screen. The third packet came in at about 20 meters. And the fourth at around 35 meters. At 50 meters I definitely lost the packet. Still nothing. I am probably obstructing the signal with my body, so let's turn around. Aha, uh -huh, we have just received a packet 6 at about 60 meters from the transmitter. Not bad. Now walking back. Well, we lost packet 7. The following packets are coming through again as I get closer to the transmitter. And here we are, back with both devices side by side. So claiming the module has a range of 100 meters is probably a bit of a stretch. All in all, the tested range is pretty much what you'd expect from a budget module like this one. In my indoor tests, with the transmitter on the ground floor, it covered the entire ground floor and about 60% of the top floor. But keep in mind, my house has a steel reinforced concrete ceiling which interferes with radio signals. So the advertised 10 to 30 meters indoors sounds just about right. That brings us to the end of this video. I still have a few more things I want to cover about this module, so part 2 is definitely not out of the question. Thanks for watching, I will see you in the next one. Ciao!